Hi, I'm Robin Chimais, and welcome to Bedla Bedlam, an exploration of Orientalist fantasy and fashion via the lens of Prince Rogers Nelson. This is Act One. In the summer of 1990, while performing in Germany during his nude tour, Prince met a 16-year-old ballet and belly dancer by the name of Maite Garcia. As told by Maite in her book, The Most Beautiful, after attending the concert with her family, her mother decided that Prince should see her dance. Her mom managed to get a videotape of her belly dancing to security, who then passed it along to Prince. Prince, immediately enchanted by her performance reel, asked for Maite to be brought to his dressing room to chat. This was the beginning of their friendship during which time she would regularly send him tapes of her most recent belly dance performances. Now, I use the word enchanted partially because I'm sure that it's very true that Prince was enchanted by Maite's belly dancing, but also when you think of belly dance, or when it's described, words like enchanting, hypnotic, exotic, and my friend Johnny Farage's personal favorite, haunting, are often used or come to mind. I first want to talk about this aspect, this enchantment with belly dance that Prince experienced upon watching Maite dance, and the roots of Orientalism bound to this enchantment. When I speak of Orientalism, I am more or less using the term as defined by Palestinian American cultural critic and scholar Edward Said in his book of the same name. Said used the term to describe the ways in which European academics and artists distinguished the otherness of Near and Middle Eastern people. Usually, their depictions were extremely biased and exoticized interpretations of, of the cultures and customs. Said said that Orientalism, as an idea of representation, is a theoretical one. The Orient is a stage on which the whole East is confined, meaning it encompasses the entire Eastern world without much distinction, and this dumbing down makes the East less fearsome to the West. He goes on to say that for the developing West, this was a major factor in the advancement of colonialism. African Americans are not impervious to buying into Orientalism. However, the roots and reasonings for the interest aren't about superiority or domination. From my perspective, it's more of a heightened fascination with that supposed mystical nature of the East. My own dad, who traveled to India as a merchant marine before I was born, told me a story about visiting a fortune teller where, when he was there, her telling him he was going to have a daughter, giving him some special pills, and shooing him away. Yeah, right, Dad. I mean, it could have happened, but now that I'm an adult, I'm more inclined to believe he made it up as a way of mystifying his time abroad. So soon after Maite met Prince, she would be asked to join his band, and Prince officially presented her to the world with the release of the Love Symbol album and on the Act 1 and Act 2 tours, which took place in 1993. The following year, Prince released Three Chains of Gold, a direct-to-video mini-movie, which featured music videos from the songs from the Symbol album. The movie attempted to tell a fairy tale about Maite being an Egyptian princess, her father, the king, is murdered by seven men, while Maite is skinny-dipping with her friends. Apparently, he owns these three chains of gold that are sacred for some reason. She grabs the chains and flies to Minneapolis. There she finds Prince, which was easy because he's in the middle of the street singing, My Name is Prince. She gives him a tape of her belly dancing, and on the tape, she also tells him that she needs his help to protect her from the men who assassinated her father. So the plot makes very little sense at all, but the movie itself is beautifully shot with lovely scenes of Maite walking through the streets of Cairo, dancing at the pyramids, getting a fitting for a belly dancing dress, all interspersed with the music videos. These scenes definitely set a feeling of magic and mystery surrounding Egypt, Maite, and belly dance. Not knowing much at all about Egypt or the Middle East at this point, I totally bought into the idea that Maite was Egyptian. Ah, cultural appropriation. By definition, it takes place when members of a majority group adopt cultural elements of a minority group in an exploitive, disrespectful, or stereotypical way. So was Prince's Three Chains of Gold Orientalist? It absolutely was. But was it cultural appropriation? From my assessment, no, simply because Prince was not mocking or disrespectful. And as time went on, Prince's interest in the Middle East, particularly in Egypt, deepened and matured. Most importantly, he spoke out on the West's problematic and self-motivated interest in that region, with songs like Cinnamon Girl and Act of God. So this is a part of, of the world that he genuinely cared about. My problem with Three Chains of Gold is more about the fact that it was poorly written and very sloppily edited. 
Prince was not the first or the last artist to incorporate Middle Eastern instruments, dance, and attire into his work. In fact, there are some very interesting and significant connections between African Americans and the Islamic world. To understand the how and why, let's take a quick look at the beginnings of the Great Migration. Starting around 1916, African Americans driven away by the South driven away from the South by Jim Crow and the deplorable economic conditions there, began migrating to northern cities to find work. A factory worker in the North was typically paid three times more than what a black person could expect to make working in the rural South. So by the end of 1919, it was estimated that about one million African Americans had left the South for cities like New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Detroit. In his book, Rebel Music, Race, Empire, and the New Muslim youth culture, author Hisham Aidi writes, as millions of African Americans flooded northern cities, they encountered migrants from various parts of the colonized world, from Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, who were fleeing conflict and colonial rule. A major result of this merging was the conversion of thousands of African Americans to an Islamic sect called Ahmadi or Ahmadiyya, which originated in Punjab. The Ahmadiyya have long been persecuted for their beliefs. Aidi explains that that is because the founders claim that he was the Mahdi, the figure that would appear at the end of times, and the Prophet Muhammad was not the last, caused his sect to be seen as heretical in the eyes of mainstream Muslims. So what was the draw to this religion for African Americans? Aidi explains, Muslim prayer and the dietary rules provided structure in a world suffused by drugs and alcohol. Languages like Arabic and Urdu opened up the texts and cultures of other civilizations and provided a connection to a rising post-colonial world. By identifying with the Islamic world, the African-American converts would go from being a downtrodden minority to being part of a global colored majority. Even more interesting is that a large number of these converts were jazz musicians, Aidi says. The mass conversion of jazz musicians to Islam prompted Ebony Magazine in 1953 to publish an article on these 200 or so Muslim musicians with the headline, Ancient Religion Attracts Moderns, which not inaccurately described the conversion as a response to segregation. Muslim identity helped blacks in America sidestep legal racial barriers, especially down south. Some of these musicians also took on their own version of Eastern attire to correspond with their new beliefs. Lynn Hope, who became al Haj Abdullah Rashid Ahmad, was also known as the Maharaja of the saxophone and donned a turban during performances. With their conversion, name changes, and adoption of clothing from the East, many of these musicians found that they were perceived to be from the Middle East and were treated better. Bassist Ahmad Abdul Malik claimed to be Moroccan, but was actually born in Brooklyn to Trinidadian parents. He incorporated traditional Middle Eastern instruments with his jazz sound and was a solid oud player. One of the most fascinating musicians I've come across who emerged around this time was not a Muslim convert, but a jazz pianist who, who portrayed himself as a French Indian musician from New Delhi named Korla Pandit. Corla was actually African-American, born as John Roland Red from Missouri. As Corla, he became one of the first TV stars, and though no one realized it, one of the first African-American TV stars. To music, it is our pleasure to present to you Corla Pandit. I know many of our viewers would like to know uh, some of your background so why don't we start with a very elementary thing where were you born i was born in new delhi new delhi india okay. and uh, started performing music in a sense at a very early age two years or four months old <laughs> There were stories that he married a wealthy Texas oil woman. There were stories that he was gay, that he died, that he disappeared, that he was playing in pizzerias. Anything was possible with Carla. He took you on this emotional geographic trip and it had a rise and a fall. It told a story every show in a way that was uh, part Hollywood and part imagination. I would dare say that some of the audiences that heard Call the Bandit had their lower chakras resonated by sound almost as a sonic dildo in a way that they hadn't experienced before. The sound is 
is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Sound, sound vibrations. And in sound, you might say as Emerson did one time, vibrate a string and all strings in tune vibrate in unison. And I add to that, and so does the heart of man. He did approximately 900 shows uh, entitled Corla Pandit's Adventures in Music, which debuted in 1949. He never spoke, just played organ and piano, often while gazing longingly into the camera. Some of those gazes were so Prince-like, I have to wonder if Prince knew anything about this guy. What is most fascinating about Corla is that his true identity was not uncovered until his death in 1998. Dizzy Gillespie, the famous Dizzy Gillespie, occasionally worked with dancers who performed live uh, to, per, who performed live to his orchestra. There's a great film entitled Jivin and Bebop from 1946 with Dizzy and his orchestra performing several of his compositions. There's one really interesting clip of a dancer named Saji Jackson performing a tune called Show Nuff. <laughs> What I find fascinating about this clip is that Saji is performing in what be, could definitely be considered a two-piece bedla or belly dance costume. She wears a decorative bra top with a sheer flowing skirt, a hat with scarves draping down the back, and scarves attached to her armbands. Save for some snake-like movements you see here, and hip movements at times, her dance is not really belly dance, but it looks like it could be some sort of inter interpretation of Eastern dance as she envisioned it. Around the same time in Egypt, there was a booming music, dance, and film industry in what is now known as the golden age of Egyptian cinema. All of the top singers and dancers of the day made musical films during this period. Here is a clip of one of my favorite belly dancers, Tahia Karioka. And if you'll notice, her outfit is pretty similar to Saji's. In these films, you often saw singers performing with dancers. That was just the way they did it. I love her smile. <laughs> I've watched countless Egyptian films from this period, and what is evident is that they were inspired by the artists in the U.S. here, just like artists here were inspired by the East. Many dance numbers in Egyptian films feature jazzy tunes and an array of dance styles from the West. Here is Naima Akef, one of the belly dance superstars from that era, performing tap dance. So is what these dancers and musicians engaged in considered to be cultural appropriation? Can an oppressed people appropriate from another oppressed, colonized people? It's clear that for the black musicians and artists who chose to change their identities, doing so was primarily for the freedom from oppression it provided. The appeal of Near and Middle East and the appeal of the Near and Middle East may have held some allure based on Orientalism and the exoticized beliefs about that part of the world. But the connection became something deeper and historic. The period of the 1940s in particular was highly creative with some beautiful cross-pollination of cultures within art, not just from west to east, but from the Orient to the Occident as well. Act two. Now, here we get to the juicy stuff. The Love Symbol album was a highly transformative period for Prince, and like many African-American artists before him, he too turned east for spiritual inspiration and renewal. With every Prince era, there is a look and style that frames the story of the music and the experiences of his world in that moment. The looks worn during the Love Symbol album period were no different. As Prince evolved as a musical icon, he was also continuing to evolve as a fashion icon. His, collaborat his collaboration with designers Stacia Lang and Debbie McGowan produced what I feel are some of his most iconic fashion moments. What I don't think is readily picked up on is how they were able to work in very subtle references to the influence of Egypt in Maite's belly dance costuming and to Prince's clothing during this period. The belly dance costume, let's just talk about this for a moment, uh, emerged as a result of European stage plays and operas with characters like Salome and Shahrazad. This set the standard for what audiences came to expect as a depiction of an Eastern ingenue. 
On the BellyDance.com blog, dancer Davina explains, This costume style, born of European opera stages, was imported back to the Middle East, and especially to Egypt, where dancers performing on stages in clubs for tourists and locals alike embraced this formula and dubbed it the bedla, or the uniform of the professional working dancer. So see you see more cross-pollination here. The belly dance costume, as we've come to know it, is not actually something that origina originated in the East. The word bedla, translated from Arabic, means dress or suit. In belly dance, bedla generally consists of a beaded bra top, belt, and skirt. This style changes as often as any other fashion trends, but the bra top and skirt has been standard since the beginning. The belly dance theme scene here in America was thriving in the 1950s and 60s. Interestingly, the costumes worn by Egyptian dancers started to look a lot like what was being worn on American belly dance album covers. During the 90s and the 80s and early 90s, costumes became extremely luxurious, intricate hand beaded motifs stripping with the most the finest stunning glass beaded fringe and lots of it became the hallmark for every professional dancer from Cairo to New York and beyond. The gorgeous costume Maite wears in the 7 video is of that style and is by top costume designer in Egypt at that time, Madame Abla. Madame Abla's work made quite an impression on Prince. According to Maite, the last dress Madame Abla made for me before she died was a sheer, cold, black gown with gold coins. Each coin was sewn on by hand and perfectly placed so they jingled it with a soft, eerie music, like distant wind chimes when I danced. When Prince saw it, he loved it so much, he had his wardrobe people call up Madame Abla. She sent them some extra coins and they made a jacket for him in the same exact style. Madame Abla's dress can be seen in the movie Three Chains of Gold. The traditional coins have what looks to be Arabic writing on them. More than likely, the coins that Madame Abla sent from Egypt had that motif pressed onto them. When Prince performed in New York for the Act One tour, he wore beautiful jackets with gleaming coins along the cuff and collar. Prince later had several other jackets made by his designers at Paisley with coins. One jacket designed by Debbie McGowan has coins with a motif of what appears to be a Greek centurion warrior. Another created probably after Ch Prince changed his name, have payettes, large sequins that look similar to coins, with his symbol emblazed on them. One outfit from this period that Prince wore, which has several influences from Middle Eastern art and attire, is this ensemble. This was the definitive look from the Sexy MF video, but he had several colors of this particular suit. What I noticed is that the buttons are arranged uniformly and very close together and form a look that is extremely similar to the decorative closures on caftans from Morocco. Another thing I recognize is that floral motif on the lower part of the sleeve. It bears a striking resemblance to floral motifs I've come across on various items from Turkish tiles to Moroccan slippers to this wall hanging I have from Egypt. Another interesting ensemble is Prince's outfit for the 7 video. Stacia Lang, who designed the piece, said that around this time, Prince had requested something to be made for him out of chain mail. Noting that Prince would be uncomfortable on chain mail because of the way it rubs against the skin, she ordered a geometric lace, cut out sections of the lace to expose more skin, and added diamond-shaped studs to each diamond in the lace pattern. It gave the chainmail effect he wanted, and the result was another standout piece. When I learned that Prince originally wanted chainmail, I was surprised because I can't really imagine him in that particular look. But I learned recently that chainmail has Eastern origins. According to Wikipedia, chainmail's invention is commonly credited to the Celts, but there are examples of Etruscan pattern chain mail dating back from at least the 4th century BC. Mail may have also inspired much earlier scale armor um, when it spread to North Africa, West Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, India, Tibet, Southeast Asia, and Japan. Wearing chain mail for the seven video would have totally aligned with the story that Prince was going in to battle those seven versions of himself, but more on that in a second. During the early 90s, this period around the release of the Love Symbol album, Prince had become extremely disillusioned with the inner workings of the music industry, particularly not being able to have ownership over his master recordings. This coupled 
with the feeling of this coupled with the feeling stifled over the timing in which his record company Warner Brothers would allow him to release music resulted in him changing his name to an unpronounceable symbol that adorned the album and to declare himself a slave in 1994. Much like the jazz artists that preceded him, Prince sought to escape oppression by changing his identity. In the Seven video, he kills off seven versions of himself, and in the end walks off as a Pied Piper of sorts towards a fantastical golden city with Maite in her belly dance regalia, and the boys and girls following behind in tow. He was leading us all into what he probably felt was a new beginning for himself and for those who had followed him thus far. The musical fusion within the song Seven and Around the World in a in a day, for example, is not dissimilar from what Prince did with all of his influences. He absorbed the Middle Eastern sounds that he heard and didn't attempt to copy-paste as some other, art, some other artists may have done. He made it uniquely his own, the same way he absorbed the influences of Jimmy, James, Stevie, etc., and created his own new brand of funk and roll. So as an African-American who became interested and drawn to Middle Eastern music, dance, and culture through Prince's musical nuances and vision, I have to say he opened up a world for me that I may not have necessarily chosen to know or understand. From his influence, I followed a trajectory that led to my falling in love with real Arabic music and Indian music and dance, and I've learned more about myself and the world around me than I ever would have dreamt and continue to learn and be inspired. Of course, this is just one, one of many doors that Prince opened for me, my Pied Piper, and I'm truly grateful for all of them. Thank you.